Okay, so now that I hit the recording button, um, I want to welcome Robert Oaks. I also want to welcome all of our uh, patrons who have logged on early. Uh, I'm Linda from the Upper Saddle River Library, and we are in for a spooky Halloween treat, I hope. Uh, Robert's going to be discussing ghosts of northern New Jersey. Uh, Robert is, is an author, a teacher. Uh, he's up in Massachusetts now, he does do guides of uh, the manor up in Lenox, Massachusetts, both uh, online and and, and 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 in person. But um, he's originally a New Jersey native and knows a thing or two about um, the ghosts around here. Uh, we do have one of his books. We have the New Jersey book in our library right now. And, and there might be another one that you would do ghosts of Northwest New Jersey, but uh, I know you were thinking about maybe doing one a little bit more of us in the Bergen County area. Yeah, Northeastern is on its way. Yep, up. I'm very excited. Okay, so with that, um, I am going to mute everybody, and uh, I will look at the chat as well. But uh, Robert is going to uh, will can open it up for questions at, at the end of the program. So um, with that, I'm going to mute myself as well, and I'll let Robert take it over. All right. Well, thank you so much. And this is really just such a pleasure to be doing this, particularly at this time of year, uh, when we start to think about all things dark and spooky. Um, I kind of think of this as my busy season, as you can imagine, um, doing tours and readings um, uh, about uh, things that go bump in the night. So I'm going to just start up my um, presentation here and um, share my screen. So uh, let me know if you can't see or hear anything that I'm saying uh, or showing. Um, but let me just get this going here um, and then we can start. So can everybody see my screen okay? It looks great to me. All right, awesome. Well, so uh, yes, Ghost of Northwestern New Jersey is uh, what we're gonna look at, but I will mention at least one or possibly two places that I've now been looking at to uh, Northeastern New Jersey, which is really my home. Um, I grew up, as you're saying, in Nutley, New Jersey, so I'm uh, from that part of the world. And um, this writing this book was really a wonderful chance for me to get back down to New Jersey after living away for almost 20 years and connect with this place that, I, that, that uh, that's my home and learn about the stories and meet with people who have experiences and stories to tell and uh, look at places that I may have seen before, uh, but now see them with new eyes and, um, you know, learn about some places and people that I didn't know about before. Um, and one of the things I found as I did this was that when you look, you find all kinds of uh, wonderful, mysterious, um, spooky and evocative places um, all around in New Jersey, just like you can find them in, in so many places. Um, when I was starting to work on this book, um, after I had done Ghosts of the Berkshires, um, someone up that way, uh, when I told her I was writing about North Jersey or doing a book about ghosts in New Jersey, she kind of like looked at me like, wait, there are ghosts in New Jersey? And I was like, what do you mean? Are there ghosts in New Jersey? You know, And I was decided in that moment that I was going to um, uh, make it my mission to prove her wrong and so i went around and spoke to people this is one of the places i ended up at which is drew university in madison uh just love uh love this place and love the stories that they have waterloo village in byram township um, great history there and quite a few tales um, and this one it might be my favorite this is in ogdensburg this is the sterling hill mining museum um, uh, it's a pretty evocative place. Now, um, just to give you a little bit about my background and some of what got me into this, um, I do lead ghost tours in the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts. And I've been doing this now for God, about 12 years. It started um, when I took a job at a place called The Mount in Lenox, Massachusetts, and um, began to become involved in their their ghost tours It started actually right at the year that I was beginning the mount was beginning their ghost tours I had no idea at the time that I was going to get drawn into this um you know I had been an English major in college I studied the writings of the mount's famous resident and designer Edith Wharton um 
I didn't know anything about her interest in ghosts. And I didn't know that this place was so haunted and had so many stories of hauntings. And I learned all of that when I got going at the Mount. And this is a picture of the Mount. Um, it is a Gilded Age estate of which there are many in the Berkshires. And as I said, it was the home of Edith Wharton. She's best known for writing books like The House of Mirth or The Age of Innocence. But people don't know that Edith, Edith Wharton um, wrote ghost stories and was phobic about ghosts. Um, this was a, a, something that happened to her when she was a child. She uh, read a ghost story while she was recovering from typhoid. And even though at the time she was almost back to full health, after reading this ghost story, she suffered a relapse and almost died from the typhoid, became very, very sick and became very, very nervous and very anxious. And she always believed that it was the ghost story that affected her like this and made her uh it kind of changed her personality made her very anxious made her feel like what she called a dark and indefinable menace was following her wherever she went she had this feeling well into her 20s and up until that time if she knew there was a book of ghost stories in the house she had to have the book burned or she couldn't sleep at night so she was terrified of these stories but then she decided she would face her fear by writing her own ghost stories which is, I think, pretty remarkable. And over time, she became, um, she later described herself as a woman hardly conscious of physical fear. So she kind of overcame her fear of ghosts by writing about these. And as it turns out, this place, the Mount, where she lived for 10 years and had this fear of ghosts and wrote some of her ghost stories, is now known as a very haunted place. Um, there are many, many stories. I, you know, I do a two hour tour at the Mount. Um, I can't tell all the stories of the hauntings and the experiences people have had. And um, during the tour, we'll show evidence, we'll show things that people have uh, captured or witnessed at the Mount. And one of them is this picture I'm about to show you, uh, which was taken in the drawing room of the Mount. And some people see in the center um, uh, that it looks like a woman in profile looking off to the side. So this is just one of the many things that people experience and have captured at the Mount that has given it this reputation of being a haunted location. When I do my ghost tours and whenever I do readings, I will usually, uh, before I get going, I'll ask people to answer this question, which is, do you believe in ghosts? Do you believe that ghosts really do exist and aren't just something that we experience um, in a story or in our imagination or that we make up, but do we actually um, do ghosts actually inhabit our world and can we make contact with them. And I ask people to think about that think about what their answer to that is maybe you could think about that and uh, think about whether you you really do believe in ghosts. Um, Wharton had a really interesting answer to this question herself. Um, she gave a lot of thought to ghosts and ghost stories and what makes them tick. Um, after she had this terrible reaction to one, she wanted to know, like, how did the story affect me this way? And can I do this as a writer? Can I maybe affect my readers this way? So she asked this question about belief. Do we believe in ghosts? And do we need to believe in ghosts in order to experience a ghost or to have this kind of affect uh, this experience of reading a ghost story. Orton's answer to this um, was, I don't believe in ghosts, but I'm afraid of them. And this is an interesting response, right? Because um, what I think she's saying is that the experience of ghosts is not something we have to believe. We don't have to believe in them in order to have a feeling, in order to have an experience. She said that belief is something that's actually happening in our heads, in our minds, while ghosts are something we experience somewhere deep down inside of us. It's not a mental thing. It's a physical thing. It's, it's, a, it's a feeling thing. She said to believe is a conscious act of the intellect but it is in the warm darkness of the prenatal fluid far below our conscious reason that the faculty dwells with which we apprehend the ghosts we may not be endowed with the gift of seeing. She called this the ghost instinct, this faculty. She believed that all of us have it and all of us 
can access it under the right conditions that we can actually experience spirits on this level um, if we can get in touch with it in other words to experience a ghost we need to get out of our heads and part of the problem with us in our modern world is that we don't spend enough time getting out of our heads. Um, and at the time, Wharton was actually very concerned about the rise of technology and how this was kind of keeping us from being able to have a deeper experience. At the time, Wharton was concerned about cinema, which was a new art form at that time, a new technology available to watch movies, and also wireless, which in her day did not mean Wi-Fi. <laughs> but meant the radio. And she, can, she called these the worldwide enemies of the imagination. And she felt that these things were keeping us from being able to make contact on this deeper level with these very subtle spirits um, in our world. So I think one of the reasons why she decided to write ghost stories was she felt that a ghost story could help um, undo this, could help be an antidote to this. And that if we read these ghost stories, we can help, it can help awaken within us this sense of you know, the, uh, the, that sort of ghost instinct inside of us. Why? Because ghost stories, as part of how they work, um, they, they get us in touch with mystery and wonder and the unknown and the unseen, this feeling that there are things in our world that we can't know in the usual way, but we can possibly know on some other level deep inside of us. We can experience things that we can't see, but we can feel that sort of thing. And I would add to that, that a good way to get this sense back is to go on a ghost tour. When I take people through these estates and these in the dim lights with the flashlights, and we go to these places that have inspired people to have these kinds of experiences and tell these kinds of stories for years, I find that people um, kind of tune, tune out their rational mind a little bit. They kind of step outside of that like way of approaching life and they get in touch with this very thing that we're talking about, this kind of deep, intuitive, imaginative um, kind of feeling sense. Um, and by doing that, you can get a little closer, I believe, to where the ghosts are. And so we go through the estate, we sh I share the stories of what other people have experienced. And I can tell you that things happen on these ghost tours. People have all sorts of experiences. Um, and so I love to hear from people at the end of a tour about what happened for them while going on a ghost tour. Um, and when I, I was given the opportunity to start writing these books. So like as a ghost tour guide, you, of course, big part of what you do is you kind of listen to other people's experiences and you begin to kind of archive them and, sh and you know, compile um, a, a list or a sort of a, a archive of all of these different experiences that people have had and you share them with other people on these tours. And so this translated pretty well to, to writing books um, of the same kind where I go and I, I go to different places that are said to be haunted. I, I see what it is about this place. I try to see what it is about this place that has given people these feelings and has inspired these kinds of reports. And I speak to people whenever I can about the experiences that they've had. And then I, I try to document and share those with others. One of the reasons why I do this is because I find that so many people have had experiences like this, but very often people don't talk about them. Um, and people do need and want to share them. So I think that part of what happens on a ghost tour is that people begin to kind of share their own experiences of this kind. And it begins to, it feels like something that, um, that, that people love to participate in. Um, it's almost kind of cathartic, I think. So to write the North Jersey book, I began by looking around to see like what are the locations. Um, in at the beginning, I was going to write just about the whole, the entire North Jersey region, and then I realized that this is much too much for one book, and so I decided to split it into two. And so Northwestern was the first one, and as I said earlier, I'm I'm now working on the Northeastern book. Um, and so what I want to do now is I'll sh love to share with you some of what I have uncovered of North Jersey, Northwestern New Jersey, starting with this place. I don't know if this looks familiar to anyone, but this is Lake Hopatcon. And uh, Lake Hopatcon um, 
if you I don't know if you've been out that way, but it is a pretty bustling place now. Uh, lots of houses and restaurants and things sort of surrounding the lake um, and lots of people on motorboats and all this sort of thing, which made it a little bit challenging for me to uh, do what I came to do, which was to participate in this old bit of lore, which is to stand on the bridge that crosses over the part of Lake Hopatcon called the River Styx and call out for this Lenape chief named Kwakwahela. The story is that if you stand there and you call out facing this direction that we're seeing in this picture, um, that this spirit will answer you, maybe. Um, when there are party boats going by and traffic behind you, it can be hard to hear a response. Um, and some people look up at you like you're a little strange. Um, but the woman in the convenience store that I spoke to when I mentioned to her what I was doing, she said, I'd never heard that story before, but I love stories like that. Right. So she really it, she wanted to know more. And I think there was this feeling that we need to keep these stories alive because we forget them if we don't. And so here's the story of Kwakwahela, as I found out about it um, uh, through some of the things that I uh, looked into. Long ago, it was said, Kwakwahela lived with his people beside the river Styx. One day he crossed the lake to visit the chief of a neighboring tribe. But on the other side, he was brutally attacked by a bear. And though the Sasham was armed with a war club and knife, he refused to fight. The bear was his totem, and to kill it was forbidden. So he tried to run, but the bear was too quick, leaving Kwakwahela no choice. Knife and claw clashed, and blood soaked the muddy banks as man and beast battled on the lake shore. Kwakwahela killed his attacker, but suffered a fatal wound. In the morning, the men of the neighboring tribe found the bear and the Sasham's bloody club, but there was no trace of his body. Instead, they found only paw prints in the mud and concluded it had been dragged off by a pack of wolves, never to be recovered. On the night of the next full moon, Nuritikan, still mourning the loss of their beloved chief, were amazed to see a thin form of mist curl above the trees on the hillside near the lake like the smoke of a campfire. And though the wind was strong that night, the curl of mist remained unmoved. The medicine man of the clan sensed meaning in this occurrence and fell asleep that night with anticipation. In his dream, he was visited by the spirit of Kwakwahela, who said it was they had seen a mist, and that because he had killed the sacred bear, his ghost must wander the world forever in exile from spirit land. And there, where they had seen the mist rise, Kwakwahela built his spirit lodge. There he would remain. So long as the hills were standing, Kwakwahela would keep watch over his people and the lake on which they lived. He vowed to guard them and to guide them. And if they ever wanted to know he was there, they needed only to look for the, for the mist on the hillside. And if they ever wanted his guidance, they needed only to call. It is said that the mist can still be seen above the lake and trees on damp days, and anyone who calls for Kwakwahela near the river Styx will hear his spirit echo in reply. So as I said, this is an old story. Um, I found it mentioned in the, a book by this New Jersey folklorist named Henry Charlton Beck, who wrote about it in the 60s. Um, he apparently had found it in a book from the 19th century um, there were actually a couple of 19th century sources that mentioned this story. And one of them was this book by, it was called The Central Railroad of New Jersey, an illustrated guidebook by Gustav Kobe. And apparently it was this book that was published in order to kind of help uh, encourage travel along the rail line. So that was sort of like writing these beautiful descriptive things about all these little towns you could visit along the way. But one passage in that book I thought was really interesting. It describes this area of Lake Opatcon at that time in the 19th century as an area that has inspired people to feel actually pretty creeped out. Um, this is what he wrote. Kobe also suggested a darker, more mysterious presence in the lake, especially near the river Styx, which may have given rise to tales of ghosts. The shadows cast on the black water decaying trees and jagged branches, the gloomy recesses of the forest and the strange stillness 
combined to so impress the traveler on the sticks with a sense of the mysterious and supernatural that he is ready to accept without questioning the legend of the spirit said to haunt the depths of the forest back of the south arm of the inlet. It brings to mind for me something that I think about from time to time, which is that these stories that we tell, some of them may be pure fiction. The story itself may just be something that people tell, but it may be that the story is inspired by something that's there, that people don't really know what to say about it. They can feel it. There's a kind of a presence there. And so not really sure how to describe it. They just kind of make up a story about it. And that story sticks. And that might be the case with this story, that this story that people started to tell about Kwakwahela, but that the, the area may have had this kind of feeling to begin with um, that was very evocative, you know. And this is not the only area around the lake that I found, uh, the, not the only location that seems to have had this effect on people. In another 19th century source that I found, um, this is a, uh, from the New York World newspaper from 1894. There was a lot of news at one point about this one house called the Minton House, which used to stand uh, on the lake um, near the Westport area. Um, and this is a picture of it that I actually got from the Lake Opacon Historical Society it was taken around those in those days um, where people used to go to this house after it had been abandoned. But they would go to Lake Opatcon, you know, on summer vacation. And part of one of the things they had to do when they went there was to visit the haunted house, the haunted Minton house. And you can see they got pretty into <laughs> taking pictures uh, from all uh, from all the windows and all all areas of the house. But if you look in the newspapers, there were some pretty interesting reports um, from this house. So let me read a little bit of it. An article published in the New York World newspaper on January 15th, 1894, told of the ghost of the Minton Place, an empty, forlorn old house near the Woodport area of the lake, about which queer stories have been whispered for many years. According to the article, a local man named Saul Babcock, who had come to investigate the strange doings in the house, at first considered it all a passel of nonsense. But after staying the night there, Sol had a change of heart. He said he heard footsteps going up and down the stairs at one o'clock in the morning when everybody else in the house was asleep. He also claimed to hear tubs moving around in the cellar, chairs moving in the room on the first floor, and loaves of bread being slung against the pantry door. But what scared Saul Babcock the most was what came through the cellar door. Saul said, the latch raises of itself, and the door opens of itself, and a cold gust of air comes reaching into the room like it came out of a graveyard vault. Then a waxy hand without any arm or any lodging for human vitals comes up out of the cellar, carrying a sort of blue lead, and then goes poking around the room at just the right height a person would carry it, and then goes upstairs and holds itself over sleeping people's faces like it wanted to make sure they were not the ones it was looking for. Now Charles Babcock, who I believe was his son, who had lived in the house before being driven out by the paranormal activity, said he considered the cellar to be the center of disturbance. He claimed that his wife's griddle was repeatedly taken down the cellar stairs or propped up against the inside of the cellar door. Charles also said he often heard footsteps uh, slowly ascending the stairs leading to his bedroom where they would stop. But his most startling claim involved a lamp in the bedroom, which he had left on very low one night. I had been asleep some time when I was suddenly awakened by the room being brilliantly lighted. I sprang up in bed. The lamp was turned up to its fullest extent. When he jumped from bed to lower the lamp, he said, it suddenly dimmed again. But as it went down, I saw, or imagined I saw, a shadowy, misty sort of figure in general outline like that of a human being standing by the table. As the figure seemed to melt away, Charles said, 
he heard footsteps descend the stairs toward the cellar door. According to the article, the Minton house looked dismal and forlorn enough to be the scene of almost any form of diablerie that might be imagined, so much so that people began to give it a wide berth at night as they went over the lonely mountain road to and from their homes. But of course, these people did not give it a wide berth, but went right in there. And there was someone else, a famous investigative journalist from that era called Nellie Bly. I found an article uh, from her where she had actually chosen to go to leave her, to leave the safety of New York City and come out to stay in the house, to write about it and to try to prove that it wasn't haunted. And one of the things that I found really striking about her writings is the way that she's describing this part of New Jersey back then. She describes it as an empty, forlorn wilderness. Um, and, you know, it's just, it, it brings to mind the fact that just, you know, a little over a hundred years ago, this part of New Jersey would have been really quite, um, quite uh, wild. Um, so I'm sure that that added to, uh, to the fear factor. So I'm going to move on now to a different location. This is um, Waterloo Village. Um, I love Waterloo Village. When I was a kid, um, we used to take like class trips out to Waterloo. Uh, it's like a, you know, kind of a living history museum. Uh, you can walk around people, there would be reenactors there. Um, and, and you can see the old houses. It has a history going back to the Revolutionary War and even before that um, of, uh, of being uh, foundries in the areas and mill, uh, iron production. And then later um, is kind of a factory town. Um, and today it's kind of a living history museum. And I figured this place must have some ghost stories. And in fact, I did find one in a couple of books um, mentioned this story that apparently people tell about Waterloo having to do with Gus, um, a canal boatman um, who, who died in the town. So this is a little bit of that story. And of course there are the stories. One of the oldest tells of the ghost of a boatman who killed himself after his wife left him for another man. Henry Charlton Beck mentioned it in 1956 in The Roads of Home, and it appeared again in 2013 in the Big Book of New Jersey Ghost Stories by Martinelli and Stansfield, who shed a little more light on the spirit's personality and circumstances. The authors described the ghost as that of a guilt-stricken man walking slowly beside the canal at Waterloo. This ghost, whom they identify as Gus, takes particular interest in young women, stopping to peer into their faces before disappearing in a mist. Apparently, Gus was so distraught after spotting his wife kissing another man during a stop in the village that he hanged himself from an oak tree, and now he walks the towpath searching for his faithless wife. So again, a story, right? A story that may point to whether or not the story is true may point to experiences that people have had that make them feel as though there is something unseen that's uh, lurking here. And when I went there, what I was hoping to find was someone there who could tell me about experiences that they've had at Waterloo. But when I went there, there was no one there. I walked all around and saw no living person anywhere. Um, so I uh, did a little online research and poking around and asking around and eventually was directed to this man named Bob Parachuk, who used to work for the New Jersey State Park Service. And sure enough, Bob Parachuk had quite a few experiences of his own that he was very happy to share with me. Um, and this to me is sort of the gold mind, right? When, when you find someone who's had experiences and they're happy to talk about them um, in a certain location, for me, that really makes it personal and brings it home. So let me share a little bit about what Bob experienced in a couple of the buildings, including this one, the Stagecoach Inn and Tavern. A retired construction manager for the New Jersey State Park Service, Bob Parachuk said he experienced several unusual encounters while working at Waterloo. In the basement of the 1874 Peter D. Smith house, Bob said he was once accosted by a cold spot on a warm June day. There was no power running into the building, so it was pitch black in the basement, Bob recalled. As I went down, it took a minute for my eyes to adjust, 
Then out of nowhere, my light went out. It just totally died. So there I was in the pitch black and my spare battery pack was in my truck. So Bob felt his way out, got a new battery pack and ventured back down into the basement. As I was going down the stairs, I turned to the right and I felt a rush of cold air touch me on the back and I stopped. It hit me. It wasn't like I walked into a colder area. It was like something was following close behind me down the stairs. And when I stopped, it ran into me. That's what it felt like. It was all over my back. Now, Bob also connected me to a former coworker of his, a friend of his named Al Amy, and they both had had experiences that, again, they were both happy to share with me. Both Bob and Al said they have also experienced odd things in the Stagecoach Inn and Tavern, reportedly a hotspot of paranormal activity at the village. The ghost in the tavern in the old hotel slammed doors when I was walking around, Al said. It must be the tavern keeper or the bartender because he slams stuff and he wants you out. He doesn't want you in there. Every time I go into the tavern, it's a weird atmosphere, said Bob, recalling one time when he entered the building to do some electrical work. I was the only one in the building. I walked down the stairs and right where, right above me, was the floor I came down from. I heard the sound you hear when someone steps on a board and it creaks, but I didn't hear anyone walking up to it, and it was not an expansion from heat. It was like someone stopped and stepped on the board. I looked up and said, hello, and there was nothing, but it was like someone was coming in the building. Other workers have experienced doors slamming shut, I can't verify those, but there are the stories. These are the stories people tell. It's the stuff you hear along the line. And Al added, oh, there's plenty of action there. I love to hear these stories from these people that work in these places, right? Because to me, they have the most intimate connection to these places. They are in the deepest recesses of these places. They are there for long hours doing work, often by themselves. Um, it's very quiet work, right? If you're working alone, you know, you're just kind of in your head a little bit, or you're just working and you're doing your thing. And so you're kind of open, I think, to having these experiences. Um, and it could be that these spirits may want to uh, particularly reach out to, to them. One of the places I visited was the Stanhope House in, uh, Stan in Stanhope uh, Blues Club. As you can imagine, a lot of its spirits have to do with music. When I went there, <laughs> Um, the general manager who greeted me uh, was kind enough to start up this player piano when I was walking in. And so it set the right tone because it was like that piano's playing itself and it looked like a ghost playing on the piano. Um, but let me move on here to talk about the Sterling Hill Mine. This is, as, as I said earlier, it's kind of one of my favorite locations that I didn't even know about when I lived in New Jersey. Um, but now I've come to know it. And uh, this has gotten a lot of uh, attention in recent years. I know there's been some TV shows done about it. Um, there's, uh, they do regular ghost um, tours and paranormal investigations there as well. It is a very evocative location. While you don't go underground, the deeper mine shafts are filled up and no longer accessible to the public. You do go kind of into the mountain and you are in this dark and misty and kind of, you know, what, what you would expect would be kind of this cold and clammy atmosphere where sometimes these little vapors just kind of form along the passageway. So it's easy to understand why people walking through a place like this would have, you know, the sensation that they are seeing something uh, moving ahead of them or around them. What was interesting to me is when I went, when I first reached out to the place, um, the first man I spoke to is the president of um, the museum that's there now. And he uh, was quick to tell me that he is a scientist and that he does not believe in, in ghosts, right? As, or as you see, the way he put it was, I'm a scientist and it is, um, or, I'll actually read the quote, I'm an engineer. That field is totally based upon science. I don't believe in this. That was the beginning of our interview. 
And I kind of thought maybe that was the end. <laughs> but then he leans in, he looks at me and he says, but I have experienced here things that are beyond belief. And I was like, okay, game on, we're in now, right? Because, and it's a really interesting thing that he, that he said that connects with what I was saying earlier, which is that you cannot believe in something. Your rational mind, your scientific mind might tell you this isn't real, but nevertheless, you can have an experience that causes you to have a little bit of a conflict now <laughs> because you've had an experience that you shouldn't believe in and nevertheless, you've had it. So then he proceeded to tell me some of the things that have been reported there, including things he himself has experienced. I'll read a little bit. People have seen orbs and figures made of black smoke. They hear things, names spoken and voices from deep in the mine. Someone once spotted a phantom face peering through the window just beside where we were sitting. Psychic sense the resonance of a tragic accident in the east shaft. And some tour guides refuse to venture into the mines at night, afraid of what they'll hear or feel while alone in there. There's definitely something going on here, Bill said. This is the real deal. And then Bill went on to tell me about his own experience. I once saw a lady in white in the geotech building. It was early in the morning and my wife and I were the only ones in the property. My wife was working over in the office, and I was the only one in the building. First, I heard a faint whisper for almost, for about 30 seconds. It seemed about 10 feet away from me where I was standing, toward the center part of the room. Then I saw a figure, only for a split second, but I saw it. I will admit that I quickly left without grabbing my tools. But that experience didn't stop Bill from staying overnight in the same building once while doing some maintenance work and that night he said he heard something up on the second floor i had put a new coat of polyurethane on the floor of the boardroom upstairs and i had just gone to bed downstairs when i started hearing footsteps up there the room was locked and there was caution tape to keep people from walking on the floor so i went upstairs ready to kill whoever i found but there was no one there and there were no footprints on the floor. Now, Bill led me out to meet with this man named Ken, who was one of the tour guides of the museum. And um, Ken started to share with me some of the things that he's experienced and that others have. You come in here at night, he said, and you hear things. You hear clanging like a metallic sound. I haven't heard voices because I'm usually with other people, but there's no question I have heard sounds and it makes your hair stand up on end. Interestingly, on the tour that he led us through, I did hear sounds. I didn't hear clanging metallic sounds. To me, it sounded like deep, deep, like rumbles, like coming from deep somewhere down below. Even though I knew that the, the, the shafts below us were all filled with water. You know, this place goes down very deep, um, but the, all the lower shafts are filled with water so there shouldn't have been this sound coming up, as far as I knew, but nevertheless, I, I was hearing something. Um, he also introduced me to this, told me about a man who had worked there and had been a miner and then became part of the museum once, it, once the mine was shut down and it was turned into a museum. And this man named John Kolick, who died um, not that long ago, and they have put a, a sort of memorial to him in the room where the, all of the miners' lockers are. One of the lockers has sort of been set up as a memorial for him, which I thought was really beautiful. And um, the fact that they honor this man um, in this way and remember him in this way, he was very much a part of the of what of saving the mines um, when they were filling with water. He was pulling out a lot of the minerals and stones that were down there, some of which had not yet been classified. So this was like new minerals that they were discovering. And um, so he was kind of preserving the history of the place and preserving um, the, the stones. And so um, to me, um, it seemed to me pretty clear that it, that it could be his spirit, you know, kind of watching over the place. And other people have said that they have heard what sounded like his voice. He apparently had this very distinct kind of gravelly voice. One of the things that's most um, like evocative about this location though, is the, you know, go deep down inside or deep inside the, the mountain there. 
and they shut off all the lights so you really are in the dark and they light a candle thankfully <laughs> but that kind of just makes it eerier and then they take you into this room where they put on this uv light and then you see the real magic of this place which is all of these stones that come alive with this kind of phosphorescent glow um, under uv light and when i looked at this i to me this seemed like the ghosts of the mountain you know these these stones that come alive um, that shouldn't have light in them and they do um, under the right conditions in the dark um, and so to me it kind of just was a, a symbol an image of the of the spirits of the place well let me tell you about the haunted vapor room i love this place um, first of all it's called the haunted vapor room <laughs> so um i thought well they've got to have ghost stories right um so i went there it's um it's a uh, it's a vape shop um in it is in the town of franklin and um it's an old house actually it was the it was the, the home of a man named Samuel Munson and his family way back. And the woman who owns it now is a woman named Cindy Barton. She runs the vape shop and she has, um, I think, lived in the house um, at different times. Um, they ran a cafe there, um, but now they have this vape shop. So she met with me and uh, she told me about her experiences. She walked me through the whole house. She actually gave me permission to go venturing up into the attic uh, looking for uh, whatever might be up there and kind of just walking around the house to feel out the place. And one of the things that I think is sort of funny about this story is that Cindy apparently is getting, or has been getting pranked kind of mercilessly by the spirits of the house. Um, she wants to see the spirit, but the spirit doesn't show itself to her. It shows itself, she said, to others, like her husband who doesn't believe in ghosts. Um, but what she experiences is a lot of pranking. Um, so let me share a little bit about her experiences. Um, Cindy said, the spirits somehow moved a vacuum. I was vacuuming and I went into the room and came back out and it was gone. And I'm like, it's a freaking vacuum. How did you hide a vacuum? You're a ghost. Where did you put it? After looking in closets, in the upstairs rooms, Cindy said she returned to find the vacuum sitting just where she had left it before it went missing. And I'm like, you're kidding me, right? But that's the kind of thing that happened to me. They were just messing with me like it was a joke. Cindy said she began to tell the spirits to knock it off. I just start saying to them, seriously, I don't have time for this. Put it back. And I would go do something else and then it would be back. And after enough of these experiences, Cindy began to demand that the ghost show itself. I'd walk all through the house and I'd be like, come on, where are you? But the ghost has yet to appear to her. However, her husband, Pat, who I said doesn't believe in ghosts, has had an experience. This is something that happened to him. Um, he apparently said the whole thing is BS, right? He doesn't believe in it, but one night, as Pat was pulling away from the back of the building in his truck, he spotted a face peering out through a window in the stairwell, a window that sits about eight feet from the floor, which means that if someone were peering through it, they'd have to be, yeah, they'd have to be hovering, said Cindy. So when he called me and he's like, who's in the building? I just saw somebody in the window and I'm like, go back and see who it is. When Pat flatly refused to re-enter the building, Cindy asked, well, who did you see? To which Pat replied, I think I saw the ghost. Now, apparently, as I said, Cindy believes that the spirit haunting this house is this man, Samuel Munson, whose grave you can find not far away. He died in 1961. His family lived there. But according to some of the reports, it seems as though it may be a child that haunts this house. Um, though the ghost may, this ghost may be the most prominent one in the house, it may be not the only one. There may also be the ghost of a playful child. When we first bought it, I had Thanksgiving dinner here, Cindy said, and the whole place was empty. My niece, who was three at the time, was upstairs playing, and then she came down. Cindy asked her niece what she was doing up there, and her niece replied, I'm playing with the little girl. 
two women who once owned a gift shop on the second floor may also have experienced frequent encounters with this little girl ghost. They sold toys, Cindy explained, and they would come in and all the toys would be on the floor in the middle of the room, all set up like there were kids up there playing. What made this all the more amazing was the fact that the gift shop owners had always kept their doors locked at night with a deadbolt. And apparently this child spirit would wander around the basement. There was, there was this one story, Cindy said she came in once to find white footprints like chalk or paint, child-sized footprints all over the basement floor. And nobody would, uh, would say, would, you know, admit that they had done it. Nobody, they didn't know how, where this came from. Um, also some workmen that they had hired who apparently were too afraid to work down there without turning the music up way loud. So Cindy came home, came back once and found them like blasting the music in the basement. And she asked her husband, like, why are they doing that? And her husband said, it's because they don't want to hear the little girl laughing. So apparently these guys were hearing some children, ch child's laughter down in the basement. There's a really wonderful story um, out in the Newton area. Um, it's one of these stories that almost seems like it can't be true because you, you hear about it, but then you find nothing in the historical records, um, no newspaper articles that tell of what people say happened here, which is that three children wandered um, into a, a hole uh, in the side of a rock face and then died in there and when their bodies were never recovered and so the town just kind of closed up the hole and put this tablet there um, with their names on it and you can actually find this tablet it is there um, but as I said you you look around and you find no reports of this uh, uh, in any newspapers from the from the time period which just seems strange to me um, but um, Another thing that people say about Newton is that there are all of these tunnels under the town and that some people say the ghosts emerge from these tunnels and haunt the downtown buildings um, coming from some somewhere down below. One story out in this part of New Jersey um, is the story of the White Pilgrim. This was an itinerant preacher named Joseph Thomas who contracted smallpox in the 19th century as he was traveling around wandered into or came to this town Johnsonburg to preach and, sh and then shortly after that died. And so he was buried by the townspeople in an old unused uh, cemetery. And 11 years later, they moved his body to this one, the Johnsonburg Christian Cemetery. But interestingly, they moved, they buried him in such a way that his tombstone is very far away from the others. His is that white obelisk there. And it suggests that they thought that even in death, um, the smallpox could somehow infect um, the others. So they kept him apart. But people say that his ghost haunts that entire area. Um, this cemetery, but some of the churches as well. There are stories about the white pilgrim haunting this area. Um, you can find um, him apparently uh, popping up in all different locations, which on one hand suggests that maybe the story has gotten a little confused. Um, but also, it's possible, I mean, he was an itinerant minister, so maybe he was wandering around um, in death, just as he had wandered around in life. That's a picture of him here. Shades of Death Road. I mean, a name like Shades of Death uh, for a road, pretty much, uh, you can guarantee uh, that it is going to inspire some ghost stories. And it's one of these things that you sort of ask the question, which comes first, right? The name of the road that made people start to tell stories about it, or the people had a ghost experiences there and started to call it something spooky. Um, I found a number of different possible reasons for the name, like where it came from. The one that seems most credible is that in the 19th century, um, there was this, there were frequent mosquito outbreaks or you know malaria outbreaks because of mosquitoes that were pretty rampant in the area, uh, which so every year, many people would die from this or become very sick until finally the, the, the government drained um, the area and the mosquito problem was, I guess, solved. But you drive by this one area called Ghost Lake. And uh, again, with a name like Ghost Lake, it's got to be haunted, right? 
Spirits are said to appear in the tendrils of fog that often swirl over Ghost Lake. Many, though not all, identified as Lenape, even though this man-made lake did not exist in the days when the people, when their people inhabited the area. According to reports, the lake was created in the 1940s by two local landowners named Leon Hull and William Krauss Jr., who gave the lake its spooky name and dubbed other nearby landmarks Haunted Hollow and Murderer's Mountain in an apparent bid to scare off would-be trespassers. Even though the name may not have been inspired by any actual ghost sighting, many claim to spot spirits on the lake today. In Ghost Hunting New Jersey, Laura Laddick tells of an undead bride and groom said to have been seen emerging from the lake, and local resident Bob Parachuk told me about the wraith-like shapes in the fog that a friend of his once reported seeing. After looking for ghosts over the lake that bears their name, I continued down shades of death road, hoping to drive its length before night fell. And as I rounded the curves under the low limbs and violet sky, I peered into the darkness at the edge of my flashlights, wondering what strange things might appear just beyond the next bend. I could feel the wheels turning in my mind, the spirit of invention on a cold October night on a road called Shades of Death. I do recommend if you feel like taking the drive, it's a beautiful part of New Jersey. Um, go at twilight and you'll get this kind of view. And I think it is easy to understand why people get this kind of spooky feeling. And there's a few roads in North Jersey that I found that have this kind of um, lore surrounding them. Clinton Road is another one. Clinton Road you'll find on lists of the most haunted play road in America, the most haunted road in the world. Um, and there's so many stories surrounding Clinton Road. I feel like it's almost like, okay, enough with Clinton Road. There's gotta be something else we can talk about. So we're getting near to the end. There are many other places that I could tell you about. Um, the Pollenskill Viaduct, um, the Flanders Hookerman is a great bit of New Jersey ghost lore. Um, and as I was saying, Drew University, um, known as one of the ha most haunted, you know, universities or colleges in America. Um, I actually had friends that went to Drew. So back in the day, I used to visit a lot. And I was told even back then about Hoyt, one of the dorms, the fourth floor of Hoyt Hall, uh, do not go up there at night. Um, and so let me just share with you a little bit about Hoyt. I got this information. There's a man that works for Drew University who is an archivist there, and he is sort of in charge of the ghost lore. His name is Matthew Bayland. And so he does these events himself. He, he leads tours and he gives talks about the ghosts of Drew University. And he was super helpful in sharing with me um, many stories, including these uh, historic photos as well. Um, and I love the fact that Drew really embraces their ghosts. Um, so uh, during the tour that he gave me, we continued on to the probably the most haunted building on campus, even more haunted than its main administrative building, Mead Hall. The dorm known to students as Hoyt, built in 1894, Hoyt Bound Hall, as it's formerly known, is the oldest of the student residences. And as such, it has had the most time to inspire tales. Most of the reports are centered around the infamous fourth floor, which many believe to be haunted by a misandrist female spirit, though the cause of her hatred of men varies from story to story. Some say she was raped and then killed herself. Others say she hanged herself after she was abandoned by the man who got her pregnant, and still others say she was thrown from a fourth floor window by a male attacker. Whatever the reason, it is believed that any man who goes up onto the fourth floor becomes her victim. Men have reportedly been scratched and knocked down, have suffered broken limbs, and have been made to feel ex exceedingly uneasy. Some students have named this spirit Carol, and have even claimed to see her, describing her long, dark hair. According to the Drew website, five students once claimed to see the dark-haired woman in an attic window, silhouetted against a bright light inside the room. The group circled the building to inspect the other windows, and on returning to the front, they discovered that a shade had been pulled down in front of the window. They then entered the building and climbed to the attic, only to find it completely dark. 
Many students have also reported odd sounds emanating from, from the fourth floor, including footsteps, creaking, music, and objects falling. But the odd phenomena are not limited to that floor. All over the building, students have reported doors and windows opening and closing on their own, shades flying up, knocks and nudges by an unseen hand, digital clocks changing time, TVs turning on, lights flickering, the appearance of glowing red orbs of light, socks and other objects going missing, all attributed to Carol or perhaps some other resident ghost. Even outside the building, spirits are said to prowl. Students have claimed to see the phantom of a revolu Revolutionary War era soldier that seemed to pop up from the ground and then vanish suddenly. Such reports have given rise to the belief that the Hoyt Bound Hall was built on top of a colonial cemetery. Well, I want to close just by talking a little bit about what I'm working on now. Um, this, by the way, is a picture uh, looking out at uh, from Sunrise Mountain, which is in Sussex County, uh, the Kittatinny Ridge. Um, it's a place called Stoke State Forest, which I always used to love to go camping here and used to love to climb to the top of this mountain, not knowing at the time that there is apparently a resident ghost that wanders this mountain. Uh, in some stories, he's called Uncle Philip, and in other stories, um, he's known as the Sussex Sorcerer. Um, but apparently, this is a man who in life used to like to go to the top of the mountain and cast spells and do all kinds of magic and witchcraft. And uh, people say his spirit still wanders there. Um, probably participate, you know, engaging in these kinds of activities. But let me tell you a little bit about this place, which I'm sure many of you know, which is the Hermitage. Um, and I was recently there on a visit, um, Marion Brown and um, one of the, uh, who's, who's a former director and the current director, Christine, took me on a tour and um, showed me around. Um, told me many of the stories, uh, many of the reports uh, about this house. Now, the history of the house is very interesting. There was um, there was um, a sort of a smaller house on the property during the colonial period that then was added to um, in the 19th century, and it became um, what you see today. Um, the stories have grown over the years, and they were helped by the residents of the house. So there's one resident in particular who I'm very interested in. This is Aunt Bess. She owned the house and she became sort of responsible for its maintenance and welfare, uh, be, you know, beginning in the late 19th century and then into the 20th century. She and her niece, Mary, um, were in charge of keeping the house going. And even though there had been many offers to buy the property, um, uh, the, 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 they did not want to sell. They wanted to preserve it um, and keep it alive um, and keep the family legacy, the family history going. But um, that meant that unfortunately they, 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 they really had suffered quite a lot because there wasn't a lot of money to work with, particularly during the depression era. Um, and so it was very difficult um, to maintain this house. And one of the things they did uh, to help bring in an income was to run a tea house uh, during a certain part of, the, of its history in the early 20th century. And during that tea house, Aunt Bess would sit people down and tell them ghost stories about this house. Um, and so I love the fact that ghosts um, and ghost storytelling has been a part of this house's history um, and continues to be because many people still have experiences there. One of the best known stories about um, the hermitage that Aunt Bess apparently told herself was about the Hessian soldier who was found whose body uh, was apparently sort of lot boarded up in the walls or sort of in a hidden room and there was a story about a missing money purse or gold belt or something. Um, and there's this well-known sort of recurring story or experience that people talk about of the sound of a heavy thud on the top floor. Um, almost the sound, it sounds like sort of a body falling to the floor. And Christine, who I spoke to that day, told me that she actually had this experience while giving a regular house tour while in Aunt Bess's room on the second floor. Um, she was interrupted <laughs> during her talk. Um, and she had just been talking about Aunt Bess and how she was her favorite Rosencrantz, the, the name of the family that, that owned the place. And, um, and just after she said that, um, this heavy thud uh, she heard above her head. Um, so I've 
was so happy to to walk around this house and to to see more of it than I'd ever seen before, but also to to hear more of the stories. I also visited the site of the Rosencrantz family grave, uh, which is here near the old Dutch Reformed Church, not far away. Um, and uh, it was Mary and Catherine who were the last two to live there, and they both died in 1970, at which time the house became uh, went, went over to the state of New Jersey, and now it's run as a house museum. Um, and so um, I've, I've been sort of working on this piece, and that'll be in the next book, Ghosts of Northeastern New Jersey. And there are some other locations that I'm looking into now. Um, but, you know, I'd just like to close by encouraging you, whatever you believe about ghosts, whether you believe they exist or don't, whether you've had an experience or haven't, um, I always try to encourage people to try to engage with the world in this way where you are open to the possibility that these unseen forces, that these mysterious presences, that these things that we can't maybe wrap our minds around uh, might still nevertheless be out there for us to experience. And that, that for some reason, I think certain locations seem to inspire these experiences and these stories more than others. So I encourage you to you know find these places, go to them yourself, see what it's like to be there. As long as it's legal and, and, and allowed, um, go there and see if you can um, find out about what, what makes it tick. What, what is it about this place that has inspired these feelings? And if you have an experience, I encourage you to tell your own story about it. Um, as I was saying earlier, I love to hear people share these stories about these experiences. I find that, as I said, so many people have had them, but often don't know how to talk about them or aren't sure that they'll be believed if they do. But I think that um, it's a wonderful thing to share um, and for us to realize that so many of us have had these kinds of experiences. And another thing that it does is it helps keep alive these old places and these, this old lore, which tells us something about who we once were. Um, and I found, as I was saying to Linda earlier, it, particularly in New Jersey, it can be hard in a place that is just, that is, uh, you know, where there's so much development and things move so quickly. Um, a lot of these places are lost. You know, some of the places that I wrote about, um, they just don't exist anymore. Like the Minton House, it's gone, right? Um, and the land around it is completely different, right? And so the stories really are all we have left uh, to remind us that these places were there and that these experiences were had. And so all the more reason, I think, to, to share in these stories. Um, so if you are interested in the book, it's Ghosts of Northwestern New Jersey. It is available online. You can get it from the publisher directly. This is ArcadiaPublishing.com, but it's also on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and other places. And there's more information about what I'm up to. I have a couple of other books and audio books available. Um, and I do these tours. So if you ever get up to the Berkshires, um, uh, check out some of the ghost tours that I do. And that's all at robertoaks.net. And uh, if there's time, um, and if anyone has any questions, um, be happy to uh, answer if I can. Well, thank you, Robert. That was just the right mood, I feel like, for this Halloween season. Awesome. That's great. Um, <laughs> but I think it is also what you're saying, too, like to, to quiet your mind and let you absorb a place and let the place kind of speak to you, to be a little more open, because, again, yeah. we tend, do tend to rush a lot here in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't know if anybody else wants to unmute themselves, but we do have several old homes around here, too. I don't know if anybody wants to give... Uh, Robert, some other places, because the Hermitage is extremely close to us. Actually, yeah. our high school is, it goes to the same school as, as Hohokus. So uh, if there's any other places around here that you've kind that's kind of sparking your interests right now. Yeah, I'd love to hear about it. Um, I mean, if anyone has any suggestions, but, um, you know, there are, there's um, some of the other places I'm looking into are, um, in Alpine, there's this, uh, the tower, they call it the Devil's Tower, but it, it was a, I think it's called the Rialto. Um, uh, there's some stories about that place. Um, of course, uh, William Patterson, um, there's there's the, the, the Hobart House, the Hobart Manor has many stories about it. Um, uh, so there, there is a, a sort of a list of places that I'm, that I've been sort of looking into. But I'd love to, if people know of stories, um, I'd love to hear. Well, I don't know if anybody, if anybody wants to unmute themselves, if they've heard of something or 
maybe if you guys think about it and when I do a follow-up email, like I said, this, this program has been recorded. Um, I will do a follow-up email uh, where I'll send it out. We'll, we're going to post it up to uh, the Upper Saddle River Library YouTube page. Also, our library does have Robert's book. If you want to kind of uh, get a little more into some of the other ghosts, I know you couldn't really cover everything uh, that, that is that is in the book. And um, with that, we are looking for, I am looking forward to your, uh, to the next one. And maybe we'll, we'll have to have you come back when you're- I'd love to. Start, start going now with this Bergen County area. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, between the, you know, with, with what things that are happening at the Palisades, I'm sure the Palisades Park, you know, there's just so, so many different things that have, that have happened around here. Some, I know some different canals and stuff that- uh, Yeah. You hear there were some stories go going on around then too. So a lot more lore, I'm sure, to be have. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So with that, unless anybody does want to say, say, ask any more questions, or I think we're kind Thank of- Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to stop Sorry. with-